Hi there, Sea Glass friends. It's Mary Beth Buki. It's been a while since I've done a Sea Glass lecture. Um, I wanted to thank Beachcombing Magazine for letting me do this little excursion. Um, what I've done is I'm piecing together quite a few different trips all along the Pacific Coast. Mexico, California, Oregon, Washington, um, Vancouver Island, BC, even some pieces from Alaska. So we're going to show you lots of really cool pieces from all those locations. The Hawaiian Islands, Japan, um, and so it, we're kind of kind of do it road trip style. So I got my fun little convertible here. Let's see if I can get this top going. Woohoo! And look what's behind me. It's the Pacific Ocean. Here we go. I hope you'll have fun coming along with me. Thank you to Beachcombing Magazine for letting me do this. stoppers, finials, and stems. These are all Pacific found pieces and we have our little display board that we've been bringing around the country and speaking on some of this cool stuff. Um, these are all Pacific found. It's actually quite difficult to find an intact fully you know full bottle stopper with the stem and finial on it. Again the, the finial is the top part sometimes bulbous sometimes it's flat um, and horizontal, which um, would allow for identification of the contents of the bottle. The stem is the long skinny part that goes into the bottle. Here's one of our, probably our rarest stopper, is just a dinky little red um, California found, uh, kind of near Capitola, I believe, is where we got this, and it's probably a perfume stopper. <music> Now let's go up north to the glorious Pacific Northwest where I've actually been able to live and hunt and collect and kayak along for over 30 years. The Pacific Northwest has all kinds of beaches, wide vast beaches that go on for miles. I was on this beach and nobody was here for miles. I didn't see a soul for miles. And then there's beaches, you know, like Seattle where there's thousands of people. We have seashell beaches that don't have a ton of sea glass. Um, we have mountain glacier fed uh, rivers and then shorelines. And um, some of it is very accessible and some of it is, isn't. I've had to kayak to some crazy spots. And so I wanted to share with you some of the beauty that's up here in the Pacific Northwest. <music> To some of our displays. We've got pieces kind of sectioned out by what part of the country and the Pacific Coast and the um, continent that some of these pieces are found. It's been kind of fun. We've taken this around the um, country and done some really pretty fun lectures meeting some people and a lot of neat people have given us pieces um, for study and education. Um, so anyway it's it's been fun. These are right here we've got some bottle parts not exceedingly rare but it is um, harder to find a rim, a neck piece, a bottle lip, than it is to find a, just a simple uh, flat piece of sea glass. That's a great uh, blob top right there. 
nice one in dark purple. We, we don't find a lot of dark purple in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we've got some great reds. I'm going to show you some neat pictures of uh, some of these uh, lens pieces and also some decorative pieces. Probably these are uh, those round ones are like uh, cycle cycle lights pre 1950, and we'll hang on to those forever. So now, in addition to stoppers and stems and finials, handles, rims, threads, signal glass lens, we also have. Uh, beads and buttons. I'm going to say antique and that reminds me, um, this is a great reminder, there's a difference between ancient, antique, and vintage. Anything that's ancient is over 1400 years old. Anything that's antique is considered 100 years old from current time and then anything that is vintage is 40 years old. So that helps with dating things. I'm going to call these all antique. These are all late 1800s, early 1900s um, <clears throat> beads, faceted. That turquoise one is one of my favorites. The red ones, often when you find red beads, they can originate from fishing lure pieces and fishing pole pieces. Um, that yellow one probably glows bright UV. I've collected these all myself along um, just 20 years of trekking and hiking and 30 years of beach combing and walking and studying so it's been pretty cool to beads and buttons there are some other great pieces that can and have been found along the Pacific and I wanted to highlight this next piece right here this is obviously a handle of some sort it could be a doorknob but it's actually pretty small it's it's just less than two inches long and there's no um, metal mechanism or holes in the piece to indicate where a latch would have been so I'm thinking it might be a vintage cane topper some cane handles were made out of glass decades ago and if it's not that it's a screw on end to a curtain rod or something like that and now let's hit some california beaches now it's real important that we remember that the california coast has over 650 miles of coastline. It actually would take me about two days to travel the entire coastline. It's just very big. So a lot of people don't know that. Um, California also has various beaches. It has rocky beaches and uh, wide, vast beaches, a lot of coves and things. So you always want to go hunting where the pebbles are and where population of people used to be that would have thrown their garbage um, into the ocean and so often in the uh, late 1800s early 1900s folks would just throw their garbage off a cliff or a bluff or even to an outlying island uh, where the garbage could just be away from population also river mouths things like that are great places to collect and today over a hundred years later this is what we call uh, glass beaches and there are a few glass beaches along the Pacific coast. It's a glass beach is going to be wherever anybody discarded vintage and antique glassware. Here are a couple pics of uh, an excursion I went on with um, the Travel Channel. They followed along with me. This is San Francisco Bay probably 12 years ago. And um, we did a short little um, show about collecting sea glass and rarity and things like that. We kayaked to an island that had some private property and we had private access to it through special permission and gates and things like that. Um, but we did spend 11 whole hours filming and collecting and um, one of the things that I actually did is because I knew it was kind of a garbage beach and that it had some jagged and sharp pieces and 
um, not really well tumbled stuff. I actually brought along some really unique pieces so that we could share them and older pieces that had a lot older history and um, that was pretty fun to be able to show different kinds of glass have different history and different beaches will have different kinds of glass with different history. popular uh, different shades and varying hues of the UV lime green sea glass um, sometimes yellows and even reds and the oranges can sometimes have UV properties um, the chemical compound inside the glass for coloring purposes was um, uranium dioxide Sometimes this glass is called Vaseline glass because it looks a little bit like the color of the product Vaseline. Um, I'll show you a couple really neat pictures of the pieces here under a black light source that makes it glow. It's pretty fascinating. Trace amounts of uranium dioxide. <music> have any blue and white pottery and china pieces in your collection that's exactly what they are pottery and china um, this is called transferware most of it at least in the United States um, mid-century this was real popular stuff um, but there's a great story if you have some blue willow and if you look at it you'll see lattice you'll see boats on it you'll see little people you'll even see um, yeah, birds that but make sure you pay attention to who's crossing the bridge on the landscape of your blue willow pottery piece if you can see the the three people crossing the bridge it's the story is told of a father chasing his daughter who's chasing her um love lover One of my earliest memories took place when I was just 10 years old. I was on a boat going up to uh, Vancouver Island, Canada with my family and I had thrown a bottle into the water um, with a message in it and my address and I wanted whoever found the bottle to uh, message me. Um, about three months later I actually received a letter in the mail. A little girl on Lopez Island had found my message in a bottle and we ended up being pen pals for a long time. The beach was located just about 30 miles northeast of where I had thrown it into the water. I was also up on Vancouver Island um, just recently, a couple, few months ago, and I toured this castle that was built in 18, late 1880s. And I was looking around at some of the stained glass windows and I noticed, I, I was kind of far away to photograph it because it was uh, stanchioned off, but I noticed these fabulous windows with these great faceted red orbs in them. And it, I recalled that I had a couple pieces that looked like this. Um, I was pretty excited about discovering it. Sometimes these are called cataphotes and we see them in reflective uh, lens and um, glass uh, street signs and things like that.
Now let's skip on over to Japan's islands. Um, we do have a few pieces from some of the coastal cities there. Uh, Okinawa and Shizuoka and Kumamoto and places, coastal places like that. Most of our pieces are um, originate from things like sake bottles and some of the glass floats that were used for fishermen's nets. Um, occasionally and actually a, um, a intact one will float over to the west coast and these that's what these are right here um, they cross the Bering Sea they cross the Pacific they were used in fishermen's nets to keep their nets buoyant and sometimes they break free and float over and, and land on Pacific Coast shores and next we wanted to show you this really great fabulously large glass float that uh, beachcombing friend Susan found we definitely were able to help her identify it. We can see that this, this embossed uh, marking on it defines it as uh, manufactured by the Kawaguchi Glass Company in Japan. So we know it floated over from Japan and landed on a west coast shore. It, um, the word actually means, a Japanese word means river mouth. And actually the first time a float with this marking was reported for record keeping was in 1960. It was found on a shore in BC, Canada.